Hello, and welcome to Represent the Podcast, the show where I, Katie Beth McKinney, sit down with composers from historically marginalized and underrepresented backgrounds and discuss their works for the horn. Hope you enjoy, and thanks for tuning in. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Represent the Podcast. I'm your host, Katie Beth McKinney, and today I have with me composer Michelle McQuaid Dewhurst, and I'm really excited to have her here today. So, uh, Michelle, thank you for being here so much. I appreciate it. Oh, thanks for having me. Um, we're going to jump right in. So how did you get your start in music and in composing? Well, um, I I guess I was drawn to music from a very young age, but I didn't start any kind of formal training until the fifth grade. And uh, it was the the ritual that I imagine some folks have, have been through themselves where you, you go to to the band room and the band teacher puts a bunch of different instruments in your face to see like what ones might stick. Um, I went in there thinking I wanted to be a percussionist, but my mother had said no uh, because <laughs> she thought it would be loud. And, <laughs> and uh, what she didn't know is that percussionists get a rubber practice pad uh, <laughs> and not a, not a snare drum to start with. Right. Uh, but I, um, after playing around on a few different instruments, I was able to make a sound on the horn and the, um, the band director said, you're a horn player and being in fifth grade and knowing nothing else, I said, okay. <laughs> and so I brought horn home a horn, which was loud. Uh, so my mother's <laughs> plan, <died. laughs> uh, uh, but I, the horn just sort of found me. I'm not entirely sure I knew what a horn was to be honest, um, until that day. Um, and, uh, but I, I was able to make a sound on it and I just took to it and have been playing ever since. Um, so I, I started playing horn, um, and I guess I always had an interest in composition, but also never had a real focused way to go about it. I tried to arrange some things. I tried to sketch things, um, you know, in high school, but then I took a class in college, and it was that class that um, it was a, an open composition class, like group composition class um, for non-majors, and it just kind of caught fire in that class. And so I ultimately over time changed my career path. I thought I was going to be a high school band director. I was a music ed major, uh, but I started taking composition lessons and then went to graduate school to pursue composition. So I kind of lived this double life as a horn player and a composer. Um, I can't imagine abandoning one for the other. They're both really important to me. Oh, I love that. Where do you play nowadays? Nowadays, um, I I play in a couple of regional symphonies, um, including a new symphony, a newish symphony over the last couple of years, uh, based at my current uh, institution, the University of Wisconsin Green Bay, um, the Widener Philharmonic. Mm -hmm. Um, I also play in the Manitowoc Symphony, um, and I play in a brass quintet that's made of members of the Widener Philharmonic as well. Um, so those are those are my main outlets at the moment. Uh, but I, you know, I pick up freelance work when it makes sense and when I have time. And I just, you know, I, again, I can't imagine not continuing to play. And I tell my composition students, you know, if at all possible, remain active as a performer, because it's how you stay connected to the fact that, you know, unless you're writing electronic music, you know, you need human beings who are going to replicate your music and, and you know, breathe life into the world. And so you need to remember how to do that yourself. <laughs> and you need to, uh, and you're just, you're, you're constantly making connections with other performers if you're out there performing yourself. Yeah, it makes perfect sense to me. And I just don't know how you manage to balance doing both skills because they are both skills. And I am tired enough from just trying to be a horn <laughs> player. <laughs> it's, you know, I, I can't say that I keep both things going at the same level at the same time all the time. Um, it is a it is a balancing act. And when I have symphonic performances on deck, then that's where my focus is. And I might still be writing, but I'm not spending as much time writing. If I'm on a deadline for a composition, the opposite is true, you know. Um, so mm -hmm. I can't say that, you know, I'm one of those 
players who, you know, does a thorough, you know, hour long warm up every morning and then, you know, practices, you know, right. all day long. And I just, that it doesn't work in <laughs> to do it that way. But I do, I've, I've learned how to sort of gear up in the right way to be ready for the symphonic performances when they're coming. Um, and then when mm -hmm. there isn't something immediately on the horizon, then the horn does have to take a backseat to other things. So it's, it is, it is a constant sort of, you know, yin yang, you know, back and forth between the two. Yeah, I imagine it becomes about efficiency with that time that's on the horn rather than like, okay, we're going to sit down for six hours, you know, not that we do that now anyways, but <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, it, it really, it has to become, you know, focused practice. It has to be, mm -hmm. okay, I'm this number of weeks out and I'm playing principal. So I have to be chopped up at a certain level to make it through the concert. And so, you know, it's about increasing the amount of time on the horn as I get closer to the performance. It's, you know, and it, it's a, it's a whole thing, but, <laughs> but, you know, I've, I've, I've learned what I need to do to be ready. And, you know, it's generally mm -hmm. worked out okay. <laughs> <laughs> yep, I know exactly what you mean. <laughs> so my, my next question is normally, you know, what drew you to compose for the horn? That's probably pretty obvious since you play it. <laughs> um, but you've done some really cool um, different or like genres because um, you've got the duet for horn and trombone. You've got your piece for horn, flute, and percussion, I believe, as well, yes. right? Yes. Um, yeah, how did you end up with these cool combinations? Well, um both of those examples are these these were pieces that that I was asked to write and I was happy for the unusual combinations um so in the the duet for example I mean it that it, it, and this happens a lot actually where it was you know, the the horn player who um commissioned me to to do this Allison she said well I want to play with my friend and so we're forming a duo and we need repertoire. <laughs> so in some ways it's a solution to, the, to a problem. Well, there isn't a ton of repertoire for horn and trombone alone, right? So, so commissioning new stuff is the solution to that. Um, the horn flute and percussion piece um, that's called Sky is Falling In. Uh, and that was, that's a really important piece because of how it came about. It was commissioned by a horn player, a friend of mine, Kent Leslie. It was the very first commission that I ever received. Um, it was right out of graduate school at a time when, you know, life after graduate school looked super uncertain. <laughs> and so that boost of confidence was so critically important to the way I, you know, <laughs> the, 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 my motivation to keep going. Um, Kent also said to me, I want to write a piece so I can play with my two favorite musicians who happen to be a flute player and a percussionist. And Aww. at first I was like, ooh, huh. <laughs> and then it was a matter of, well, okay, these are disparate things, but what are a few things that they have in common? And the thing I hit on was if I have a vibraphone, if I have a flute and I have a horn player, all of those things are capable of some kind of vibrato, whether that's typically used or not. You know, we, you know, American horn players don't tend to use vibrato, but that doesn't mean it's not possible. Um, and so, you know, I, I ask the, the horn player to use kind of a wide, exaggerated vibrato you know like a jaw vibrato you know um to to kind of mimic a slower speed on the vibraphone uh when the vibraphone is on i've since learned since i wrote that piece that a lot of vibraphonists a lot of percussionists hate the motor on the vibraphone and say never ever turn it on oh no <laughs> yeah I, i've talked to percussionists who are like ooh, and i'm like yeah but i needed it for that <laughs> It's there. Right. Why not? For the know, purposes of but... this piece, give me some slack. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> give me a break. But uh, you know, and <laughs> but the it was an intentional thing. Is like, well, here's a thing that these you know there are a whole lot of differences, but here's at least one thing that these instruments can all do is use vibrato, and so that's that was kind of my way into that piece. But yeah, it, it both of those pieces they just came about because the people who asked me to write them had friends that they wanted to play with. And I love that dynamic. 
you know, it's like if people want to play together. Well, let's let's find a way to play. I have found that my favorite chamber music experiences are always the ones where I'm playing with my friends. That's, yeah. you know, it's the best way to go. Yeah. 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 My brass quintet <laughs> right now, we have a blast. We all get along and, and oh, I love it's that. super fun, you know, and it's, there's, there's nothing like it when that's clicking. Yeah. That's the dream. Yep, yep. <laughs> <laughs> so when you compose for the horn, do you tend to play on the horn and then move to a software or do you start with a piano or what's your process like? Well, um, it varies from piece to piece. In some ways, it depends on my timeline. Um, if I have a short timeline, I go directly into the computer. Um, if I have a little bit more time to sort of free associate, then I, I'm old school. I'm you know, pencil and paper. Um, and, 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 it, and, and I'm usually some kind of hybrid between those two things where I'll start sketching ideas on paper and you know, it's, it looks like garbage. It's, you know, scribble marks and arrows and, you know, just this, you know, makes sense <laughs> to nobody but me, you know, which is fine because no one has to see that. But um, I use that as a way to, to work through ideas. And once I feel like I have something that's going to stick, that's when I'll often move to the computer. So I'm, I'm kind of this, this, I'm kind of a hybrid um, worker that way. When I write for the horn, I will test things on the horn, but usually after I have sketched for a while, um, I don't tend to like improvise and then find a thing and then write it down. I tend to write first and then make sure it works. Um, it's funny because sometimes uh, you know, it's two different hats to compose and to play. And so sometimes I'll write something for a horn, I'll write an idea, and then I'll try to play it. I'm like, who wrote this? <laughs> you know, this doesn't work, you know? <laughs> uh, so I have to make sure that both of those hats, you know, <laughs> make sense with each other. Uh, but uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's amazing how, even though I've played the horn for so long, how I can sometimes, and, and when I'm writing out an idea, I can, I can still miscalculate. It's like, wow, that's harder than I thought. <laughs> Sometimes those large leaps, man, those are what always get yeah, me. Like, oh, yeah, yeah. That sounded cooler in my head. Well, yeah. well it, it sounds great in my head every time. It's on the horn. That's, really, yeah. <laughs> that, that's when, you know, all the bets are up. <laughs> right. Huh. So you talked about where you find inspiration for the, for um, the sky is falling mm -hmm. in, but where do you find inspiration for your other pieces? Like your unaccompanied works. And you've got three of those, I think, right? Yeah. And, you know, there's, I often respond to sort of little random bits of things that I run across in the world um like a little snippet of text um if that I'm reading in a larger work you know I um and, and when I write for voice too you know I I I usually text finds me if I sit down and say, I'm going to go look for a text for inspiration, I, you know, I could look for hours, days, weeks, and never find anything that feels right. But if I'm just not looking for it, it usually kind of hits me on the, <laughs> on the side of that. And I'm like, oh, Isn't that oh, always yeah. the way? I got to do something with this, right? Um, and so, so I have a, a couple of short, um, unaccompanied things for Horn, and those are, th those were there there uh both of those or two two of them were written in response to uh this great program um from an organization in New York called Composer's Voice. Um they do a concert series called 15 Minutes of Fame. And there's a soloist or a group that um is going to do a concert. They do 15 one minute pieces and they put out the call for scores and then people respond to those call for scores calls for scores um and so um i've written a couple of things for that that have been selected by horn players to play um so one one example is i, I wrote a short piece called the number for rain and that comes from a novel um it was uh, by uh, mark danilewski who had this incredible plan for a 27 novel series, um, which has all these interlocking characters and everything. It's called The Familiar. And um, he, unfortunately, it was too big of an idea for the publisher to be able to continue to support. And the series ended after five books. But 
Um, he's an experimental author who plays with the way text looks on the page. Um, and mm. I was in early on in one of the, the, in the very first book, there's a character who um, is sort of, she's observing a rainstorm that's getting heavier and heavier. And she's sort of anxiously imagining how one would count the number of raindrops in the storm. Um, and the the text on the page just becomes this swarm of overlapping text that's trying to mimic the feel of this deluge of a storm. And the phrase, the number for rain is in her thoughts as she's, you know, what is the number for rain? And I just thought, wow, cool. that's a, what a, you know, what a wild thing to contemplate. And so I tried to make something out of that. So it, that that's often true of of many pieces uh, is that some little phrase some little idea will spark something in me and then I'll feel like I need to do something with that and try to solve the problem for myself I don't know what the number for rain is but <laughs> but it was fun trying to think about that I'll write a little <laughs> piece you know <laughs> oh cool and what about um burn and rave and contact call um contact call was um that was more, I, I heard the phrase contact call. It was just about, you know, making an initial reach to something or I'm, I'm trying to even remember the context of that phrase, but the, it, it, was, it was a phrase I ran across. And so it was just, that one was written as a way to, I thought about it as kind of a concert opener <laughs> and to just, just sort of like, you know, reach out into the universe <laughs> and, and speak to an audience. Um, and then Burn and Rave um, was uh, a literary reference. And gosh, you know, it's amazing how you th these things are so important as you're writing the piece. But then when time passes, it's it's easy to forget where it came from. Mm -hmm. I honestly don't remember <laughs> right now. I'd have to go back and look what I read that um, that was... Is it a Dylan Thomas thing? It might be a Dylan Thomas thing. Um, but okay. in, in any case, gosh, yeah, I'm sorry. That's embarrassing. No, you're fine. I think it's been 10 years since it it's came out. It's been a while. Right? So, yeah, I mean, yeah. It's been a minute. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and it's funny that, you know, and I and I remember too, like you know, early on composition teachers saying, you know, if you if you want to make revisions to a piece right after you finished it, do it right after you've finished it don't think oh I'll get to it later because you won't remember what bothered you about it you won't remember mm -hmm. what the solution was in rehearsal you know all those things and I used to think oh well, how could I ever possibly forget <laughs> you know and and the thing is you know if you're going to make room in your head for the next piece you have to kind of let go mm -hmm. of the last piece and that yeah <laughs> so yeah that makes a lot of sense otherwise everything would start blending together and, yeah. and you'd never have an original thing coming out yeah, yeah. it makes perfect sense yeah to me. yeah mm -hmm. wow so how would you characterize your compositional language um I think it varies from piece to piece depending on what the piece needs um I like to think about tonality or harmony um as kind of a a sliding scale where you could think about, you know, the purest consonants on one end of the scale and the crunchiest, thorniest dissonance on the other side. And that, you know, I, I think there are times and places to be at any given point <laughs> on that continuum. Um, and so, uh, but I'm rarely at one extreme or the other. I am rarely, you know, thornily dissonant all the way through a piece I'm rarely purely consonant through a piece um and, and you know and it's and it, and it doesn't even you know it's even arbitrary to say you know consonants versus dissonance and have that be a binary and that you know I mean I, I really I try to think about well what I try to think about creating sound environments that make sense <laughs> and having their own internal logic and that logic can vary from piece to piece um i do notice certain quirks that come up you know from piece to piece certain intervals that i tend to to favor um, i love a major seventh 
<laughs> love me love seventh. Um, you know, and I, uh, there, there are probably some little gestures and things that, you know, if you, I could, I could probably count them up across <laughs> lots of pieces, but you know, I, I, I do, you know, but, but I think there's room, there's, there's a time and place for, for any kind of technique, you know, we're not bound to a particular tradition at this stage of things. Um, and I even, um, I, I surprised myself, but I, I did a piece a couple of years ago uh, for the Alma Ensemble, um, a piece uh, called Blur that was kind of inspired by the way time felt so blurry during the early stages of the pandemic when you know, we were on lockdown and all this. Um, Yes, and and time became meaningless. Yeah. <laughs> and and maybe I just felt like I needed structure in response to that because I used a 12 tone matrix for the first time in wow. you know since like I had to for an exercise or something. Um, right, since like undergrad theory, right? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. But it, it just it just felt like the right move and I I it gave me it gave me a way to build the piece that was really useful until about halfway through when I broke the matrix on purpose, <laughs> but, but I, used, <laughs> but I used the matrix, you know, pretty strictly for the first half of that piece. Um, and so it's, it really is just a matter of what is this particular piece need? And, um, you know, and, and, and so I, I think there's room to, to explore different kinds of language depending on what you're trying to say. I love that. It gives you a sense of freedom. You're not constricted to any one type of style. You can just go with whatever you're feeling in that moment. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, you know, I, I think it's, it, it would be a shame to restrict oneself to one way of working when there are so many options, you know? Absolutely. Now, at this point in your career, do you find that you are mostly being approached by people who want to commission your music, or do you do pieces just because something strikes you and you want to write it down, or both? It's, it's a mix. <laughs> it's a mix. Um, so I have a I have a commission right now from a friend and colleague that I work with at UW Green Bay, a uh, trumpet player named Adam Gaines, uh, and we're I'm just getting to work on a piece for him for uh, trumpet and electronics for an album that he's putting together. Um, and so, you know, he, he just commissioned me to do that and I'm excited to, that's why my summer project is doing that. Um, oh, cool. But, uh, you know, there are things that occur to me that don't have a particular commission, but if I feel like I have a real shot at them still being performed um, or realized in some way, then that's enough for me to take the plunge and work on it. Um, I ha have a, a piece that I've sketched at, for uh, a performer friend of mine um, who uh, doesn't know that I'm writing the piece yet, so I'm not going to spring it in, in the podcast, but but as soon as it's in a, a more full Fair form, enough. I'm going to I'm going to approach him and, and, and see if he's up for playing it. And the worst thing that happens is it doesn't fit into his performance plan right now. Um, and But I, I know enough other folks who play the same instrument that I that I'm confident I can I can find somebody who will be interested in in doing that um but yeah it, it is a mix at this point and if the idea is compelling enough to me um I will try to find a way to make it happen even if there's not a commission and if I haven't approached about it so that's so cool um, now, do you find that there is a challenge in getting your music performed? Do you still feel like you have to do a lot of self-promotion or are people coming to you and be like, hey, I played your piece last month? <laughs> um, I've had a couple of surprise performances, um, you know, and that's happened a little bit more in recent years. And that's um, it, that's a kind of a fun feeling. Um, the, the horn and trombone duet, for example, uh, because Allison and Emmy put a recording online, people have found it. And I've you know, yeah. sold the score to a couple of folks and, and it's been performed at least once by a different duo. Um, and that was just because mm -hmm. the recording was on, online and, you know, another horn and trombone duo was looking for a repertoire. Mm -hmm. Right. There's a few of us out there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know, it's, 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 uh, it, it's really cool to, um, 
to uh to see that that happening and it, and it's it's amazing how you know people stumble across your music sometimes and it, you know and it's and I, I it it's kind of a fun feeling because it you know in the earliest stages yeah you're pounding the pavement you're you know saying please please notice me right uh, and when people are noticing then that that feels pretty gratifying uh, so that that's right. pretty cool. Um, I have another, um, I, I wrote a few um, duets for voice and cello, uh, and I did those for my husband, who's a cellist, and a Aww. friend of mine um, who I, I work with at UW-Green Bay. So Courtney Sherman is the singer, and my husband, Michael Dewhurst, is the cellist. Uh, and I, I wrote a few of these little pieces. They did a recital. The program was online. There was another soprano and cello duo who was looking for music and stumbled on Courtney's information and 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 said, "Hey, where did these pieces come from?" And Courtney connected me with them. And that duo is a, a wonderful duo called Juxta Tonal, um, who went on then to commission me to write more music for them. And so it's just it's amazing how some small reference online sometimes can lead to bigger things it's been really cool to see that yeah I think that really highlights the importance of having music recorded and available because I mm -hmm. mean I know half of the time when I'm picking out repertoire I, I'm looking for other recordings and sometimes it's fun to find something that's not recorded but you know it, it gives you a sense of the piece you know and, and okay yeah Absolutely. I can take that on or uh or no I can't you know <laughs> yeah 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 no it's it's a huge it's a huge thing to to mm -hmm. be able to do that and I have to say you know I am not the best self-promoter um you know and I, I and it's just because you know I, I teach full-time I'm I'm a freelance performer I'm a, I'm a composer like that like the, the, the unfortunately the you know updating the website frequently <laughs> is not a, as high on the list as it should be um and mm -hmm. and so so that is a challenge, um, but I am fortunate that I have personal contacts and professional contacts, and that's how my my music is is performed. So, yeah, I know I heard the um, unruly energies was performed at a brass women's conference last summer, and that's where I became acquainted with that duet. And it was an amazing performance; they did a fabulous job. And now I. Think I've already purchased it, and if not, it's in my list of things to purchase. Once I have more money, <laughs> but um, it's, it's on my list of like, ooh, I'm gonna play that. So I mean, these conference performances too are so important. I think. Yeah, yeah, it was. Mm -hmm. I was so happy to be included on that, and you know, I heard their recording, and they, they, you know, they, they did a great job with it. I'm really happy with. Yeah, they killed it. Did with it. Yeah, yeah. So and that that was a fun piece to write. Um, and that one, you know, talk about you know little ideas, little references. Um. I was, um, Allison had asked for something that had sort of a folk music inspiration. And I wasn't sure immediately what to do with that. But then I started thinking about ways that other musicians that I like have used folk music. And the, the, my interpretation of that became the listening to the music of the band Gogol Bordello uh which used, which is they're kind of like a they call themselves for lack of a better term this is what they say the the word gypsy is a charged word but they they use the word gypsy mm -hmm. punk or the, the, the like that's their, okay. that's their genre because they have these, these eastern european influences on their music and i've always loved this band and so i started reading quotes and, and interviews and things with the lead singer of the band Eugene Hoots and he talked about unruly energies in the music and so that became my little seed for thinking about what that duet could be so How that's, cool. that's where that came from <laughs> Oh, I love that. <laughs> now, I I'm adore that you are doing all of the things. You are a professor, composer, performer. Do you have any advice for people who are maybe starting college or leaving college, getting into that you know early professional career to to try and create a career like you have? Sure. Um, well, I mean, of course, things are constantly changing, right? Um, Every day. So <laughs> I can't. Like if you had told undergrad me what some of my work would be and some of my gigs would be like, um, you know, I I I would have been surprised and I would have been a little scared because I wouldn't have felt prepared, <laughs> right? Because it's you know, I, I, like 
I, I didn't mention this in my playing because unfortunately the, the group has retired and it is no more, but mm. for a while I was playing in a rock symphony. Um, so it's a rock band that had was augmented by orchestral instruments and some pretty cool arrangements of things. So, you know, how cool it was, it was a blast. Right. And, and, and so no one taught me in undergrad how to play with a click track. Uh, which that mm. gig is all on a click track. So we all stay together. Yeah. Um, you know, um, no one, no one taught me, you know, how to really truly think about playing in multiple styles and how playing mm -hmm. in rock symphony is very different from playing, you know, Sibelius two, <laughs> you know, which, which right. you know, you, know, you, it, it, you know, like I, 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 that, especially when, when the rock symphony was, was uh, active, you know, my music stand would have like Led Zeppelin and Brahms, you know, back to back. And I'd be playing one gig one week and the next, another, the next week. And like having to switch performance modes like that never mm -hmm. occurred to me, you know, I, I mean, and, and so, so to that end, I don't think that any curriculum, no matter how, future looking it's trying to be I don't think any curriculum can fully prepare people for what a career might look like so my my sort of broad advice is be as flexible <laughs> as you can in how you define yourself and what you're willing to try mm -hmm. um be as versatile as you can be while still being true to yourself you know if you find that there's something that you truly, truly are opposed to doing, then that's, that's okay too. You know, you don't have to sell your soul, but being open to playing in different styles, being open to playing in different kinds of situations, even if it's not the sort of ideal dream scenario for you, like that's how we build skills. That's how we build relationships. And you never know what's going to stick and where something's going to lead. Um, so that's sort of a you know broad advice of just you know try to be open try to be try to be willing to experiment with what your career might look like um in but i think in hand in hand with that more and more i think about the way personal relationships and professional relationships are so key to everything and that you can't easily build a career if you're not somebody who is easy to work with, who's reliable, who shows up when they say they're going to show up, who commits to the thing that you've committed to. And, and, you know, mm -hmm. um, that, that I've seen too many instances where an unwillingness to bend causes problems that don't need to be problems <laughs> you know and mm -hmm. i've i've it, it's it's unfortunate um but the it's it's really important to understand the to understand how important it is to be prepared to be true to your word to show up to to mm -hmm. do what you came there to do and to set any other kind of drama aside to get the job done um that that's that's how you build a career that's how you get asked back on a gig mm -hmm. <laughs> that, that's absolutely um, you know um that that there's there's just no room for for treating people badly <laughs> so be be as uh, just be pristine in the way you treat people <laughs> you know and, and I could not agree more <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah it's 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 you know and it's and it's amazing how a good word can go really far in helping you get more gigs down the road and it's amazing how quickly a negative situation can close doors on people um and mm -hmm. I've, I've seen it happen and, and it's it's unfortunate
I have a theory about this, which is that there's a sliding scale that you can, it's like an X graph that you can fall into different points within. On the far right hand top corner, we've got the people who are amazing people and amazing performers. They're going to get hired back for everything. We love them. That's who we want to be. Mm -hmm. Down here on this side are the people who are really, really nice, but are maybe not the best players. You know, mm -hmm. they'll get asked back for some stuff, but they're not going to be on call. Then you've got the other access where there's the people who like just are the worst. They're bad players. They're not nice. They don't keep working and that's we never want to fall into that that you know the, the shadowed land that's not where we want to be um, right but there's also the other end of the spectrum where there's people who are maybe not the nicest but are such killer players they keep getting asked back but mm -hmm. we don't want to be there either i always try to aim for the the top right hand corner yeah. that's, and i tell all yeah. my students that i'm like aim to be in that top right hand corner yeah absolutely mm -hmm. you know and, and i'll i'll be really honest here if i'm choosing if I have the option, if you're in that upper corner where you haven't treated people great, I almost don't care how great of a player you are because I'm going to choose the team player. <laughs> Once we get past the baseline level of, of performance experience, is it worth it to, to, to have somebody who's a marginally better player but, but treats people badly? Uh, in my view, no, it's not. <laughs> right. I um, performed so much lately that I want to have a good time when I'm sitting yes. with the people that I'm playing with. And yes. if it's not a good time, it's just, it's a drag. <laughs> yep. Absolutely. So, you know, no matter, so, you know, this, so this, the, the advice is be flexible, not just in your artistic pursuits, but also just in the way you interact with people, you know, because that building that reputation of being kind of, well, I'm, I'm up for whatever, right? That's right. That's an attractive thing for people who are looking for colleagues and collaborators, you know? Absolutely. And I love that you brought up the click track. I was really lucky that in my doctorate, we did quite a bit of work with click tracks. Okay. Because in the last year, I have played, I think, six different performances with the click track now. Yeah. And it has come in so clutch. Having I've watched professionals who've been playing for 20 years since so their first time with that little headset on, and it throws them for a loop. Oh, yeah. So, yeah. 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 That first time is very disconcerting, you know? <laughs> it is. Yeah. It really is. Yeah. Yeah. And, and it's very different when you're in a recording studio versus on stage. I was really lucky. I got to play with The Who last year, and that is loud <laughs> you know uh -huh. so you've got that click track wailing away and you're it's very different than being in like i also recorded for a, a this is i'm not trying to humble brag here but i recorded for a bad bunny recording um That's recently that so was at cool. coachella and and it, it was a very different experience because that click is it doesn't have to be a whole lot you can have one ear out and kind of do the thing uh -huh. but on that on that who stage where it's wailing pete townsend having the best time of his life you know you, it, we had some people who were like oh i don't know if i'm comfortable with doing this how yeah. do i stay in time and we're like yeah you just have to crank it you know yeah. hope for yeah. the best yeah and you just you know and there, and you can't learn that except to just do it and roll with it yes. you know and, and it's terrifying yeah. but it's so much fun yeah oh yeah yeah when it when it works it works <laughs> yeah right when it doesn't that's a whole different well, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah oh there was there was a glorious uh, click track malfunction on one of the rock symphony gigs and we had i mean and, and oh, i love just, that we had to we had to shut we had to pause the show while the computer got rebooted <laughs> oh like, yep uh, uh, the whole thing but yeah <laughs> the, the blessings and curses of technology when yep, they work yep. it's beautiful <laughs> when they don't we crash and burn real hard <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> so what would you say have been the greatest challenges of your career so far um I think there are periods and I think this happens in any creative profession there are, you know there's there's sort of a cycle of feast or famine sometimes um mm -hmm. they're you know coming out of graduate school I was in terms of finding an academic job I was in the wilderness for a little bit um I was doing you know part-time things here and there um and and interviewing for tenor track jobs and for a little bit was sort of always the bridesmaid, never the bride on the <laughs> scene. So, you know, I did a ton of interviews and, you know, and, and, and just didn't, you know, and, and it, it took a while for something to land. Um, and so sustaining the desire and the the drive to, to get to that goal was a real challenge. And I absolutely questioned at times whether it was ever going to work, you know, 
Um, mm-hmm. And it, it, sometimes, sometimes these things are, you know, it's a war of attrition, you know, because it's sometimes, you know, if, if one doesn't have the resources to weather the storm, then you have to make other decisions. Um, I was very fortunate that, you know, I had a, still have a, a husband who was willing to sort of weather that uncertainty. And, you know, we, we worked together to, uh, you know, support ourselves during that time. And, and, you know, he worked, I worked, uh, but neither of us were quite working where we wanted to be. Uh, but we were sort of, you know, shooting for that larger goal of, well, you know, one of these days, hopefully one of these, you know, one of these jobs is going to work. And, and, and finally it did. Um, but yeah, you know, had I, had I not had that support, you know, I don't know what choices I would have made. Um, so that, that's, that was one, 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 one period that, you know, the, and, and there were, there were great things during that period too, but it was sustaining the hope, sustaining the drive, sustaining the motivation. That was a challenge for sure. Yes. Um, what did you turn to when you had those dark moments and you were like, I need something to keep me going. <laughs> I know quite a few people in the same boat right now. Sure. Absolutely. <laughs> and it's, I mean, it's, it's the, you know, the struggle is real, uh, you know, and, and this is why too, you know, when, when students come to me and say, I'm thinking about graduate school, uh, what I tell mm-hmm. them is, if you know you need to do that by going into it with your eyes wide open knowing that there are no guarantees but if this is the thing that you feel that you must do for your fulfillment for your life this is this is your drive then that's your answer about whether to go mm-hmm. or not right if you're just kind of on the fence if you're feeling well i don't have anything else to do so i guess i'll try grad school that's probably not enough to sustain you through the hard times, right? So, right. What you know, I I all I was always doing at least some part time teaching during those periods, mm-hmm. and when things went well in the classroom, there's kind of nothing like that, you know. And it's like, well, this is what I'm aiming for. I want more of this, right? And so you mm-hmm. hold on to those successes. Um, and say, well, this is why I'm doing what I'm doing. Um, when I had music performed, I said, well, that's why I'm doing what I'm doing is the feeling of sharing this with an audience, right? And it takes a lot of time and a lot of work to get to that moment. But that moment doesn't happen if you're not able to sustain yourself through those periods where it's not happening. Um, and so right. it's about, you know, celebrate the wins when you have them. <laughs> um, and, you know, and it's, it's easy to say, because it did eventually work out for me. Um, it, it's easy to say, never give up. Um, mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, but I recognize that I can say that because it worked out. Um, ugh, everyone who's on that path of trying to figure out how long do I do this until I can get to this other place, everyone is going to end up doing the life math about what's going to work for them. Um, Mm -hmm. And, you know, that's, that's a question that only the individual can answer, you know, it's, there's no, there's no clear set of guidelines. There's no, guaranteed destination and so you do the mm-hmm. best you can and you hold on to those wins and you, you, you and, and you you ultimately have to decide is this the is this the thing that I want to keep driving toward um mm-hmm. I wish I had some magic wand kind of advice <laughs> about that kind of stuff but I, I don't um but I you know I for me I could not conceive of another path and if, mm-hmm. I guess eventually if I'd had to, I would have, right. I mean, uh, right. something else, <laughs> but I could not at the time I could not conceive of another path. And so I'm glad I stuck with it. 
It's funny you phrase it that way, because what I tell all of my students and all of my maybe younger colleagues who are, you know, entering that grad school phase, I tell them, if you can picture yourself doing anything else, go do it, <laughs> because this industry will chew you up and spit you out. You have to, especially people entering doctoral programs, I'm like, you have to want that degree yep. because it is brutal. Yep. So I only graduated on time because COVID hit and I was able to be locked down and just writing for Mm -hmm. three months you know <laughs> otherwise i have no a... idea how that paper would have gotten done yeah so, yeah 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 like, when, when there were no other distractions then uh <laughs> yes you know suddenly you... i wasn't in 20 hours of ensemble every week oh wow yeah now i can write yeah but, yeah, um, yeah, yeah it was it's it's a hard choice and we do it because we love it mm -hmm. and because it's in our souls but if you know i have a very dear friend of mine who's going off to law school now after finishing his bachelor's in horn and he's an incredibly talented horn player yeah. but he's feeling called this way and i'm like then go that's yeah. great good go go be a lawyer <laughs> you know like yeah. it's no shade from me oh God, so no. yeah it's yeah it's it's hard and i've watched friend after friend after friend decide you know and they're all ultra talented i would argue more talented than i am and they're like you know i just don't want to do this anymore i'm like yeah i i get it you know it's and there, there are days where I'm questioning yeah. throwing my horn in the ocean. You know, like, <laughs> there's lots of those days. Was, so, and I live in Miami, so it's convenient. I could just do it. <laughs> <You'll> um, <laughs> right there. <laughs> exactly. I wonder how many horns are in that ocean. <laughs> Ooh, you know, get a metal detector. Start yeah, looking. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but uh, yeah, it's it's a tough it's a tough field, but those those wins i i really like you talking about the wins i'm thinking now maybe i'll get a bulletin board and make it a win wall and every yeah. time it doesn't matter how small put it on an index card and it's there and be like yeah that was a win yeah so. absolutely absolutely hold on mm -hmm. to those you know because that's what sustains right. you through the tough times you know and even in mm -hmm. teaching you know if i've had a bad day teaching if something's gone wrong whatever i've got a you know whatever the issue is i've got a nobody practiced <laughs> yeah right i've got a small <laughs> stack of like thank you cards from students oh and i pull those out <laughs> i was like oh i love that not shouting into the void <laughs> Yeah. Right. Yeah. And and we never know how we're impacting people's lives. I mean, a yeah. lot of my students are fourth through 12th grade, you know, they're not going to go on to have careers in horn playing, they're doing it for fun while they're in band. But, you know, you never know how something they talk to you about one day, you know, is going to come back. It's, it's, yeah, it's beautiful and weird. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, it's, it's, it's wild. And, and it, it's, uh, you know, my, my husband is a cellist, and he has a bunch of private students. And he talks about what he does is like, well, yeah, I'm teaching cello, but sometimes I'm a life coach. <laughs> you know? Oh my gosh. Yeah. The number of times I've been a therapist yeah, is yeah. very real and I am underqualified for that position. <laughs> <so>. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Same. But, <laughs> but yeah, it happens. It happens. It does. It does. Now here's the real heavy question. Do you feel that you've ever experienced any hardships based on your gender identity, um, both in composing or performing? Um, it's, it's, yeah, I mean, nothing that I would call overt or nothing, you know, I mean, I believe me, I know stories. Well, a lot of us know stories. A lot of us have experienced some pretty brutal things. Um, I would consider myself fortunate in that regard in that I, you know, the, the, have I experienced slights? Sure. Have I been underestimated? Absolutely. Um, you know, but have I been harassed? No, I can't say that I have well, that's good. in any, you know, in any serious kind of way. Um, so, mm -hmm. so I'm, I'm very fortunate in that regard. Um, I do, um, I, I, you know, I, 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 I do notice, acutely if I'm the only woman in the brass section <laughs> you know mm -hmm. um and I've played with tons of brass sections where that's been the case and like I say I, you know I haven't been harassed and, and and largely I've been treated well um you know but I do feel like well I have to I have to be twice as prepared um and I have to yeah, I have to be on point because I will be judged more harshly 
um, if, if mm -hmm. I'm not, you know, I have to, I have to think, I, I, I think in those terms in that situation, um, in composing, mm -hmm. um, you know, I think, you know, you never know what opportunities you weren't offered because you didn't fit the, the mold. Um, mm -hmm. I, I think, you know, people sometimes, I think less so now, but I think the, there, there have at times been assumptions about what my music might be like because of who mm -hmm. I am. Um, and I know that there have been times when people have heard a piece of mine and been surprised if they hear something that they would more stereotypically call a masculine energy if it's you know if it's loud if it's fast if it's aggressive in any way right like that that mm -hmm. oh that you you know <laughs> there's a little you know, right there, there's been a little bit of that at times but I think I do think that is shifting for the better. Mm -hmm. um, I do mm -hmm. see, you know, there are more opportunities now. There's a greater awareness now. Um, there's a lot of conversations happening about programming, um, about mm -hmm. representation, about inclusivity. Um, th these are conversations that I'm I'm really invested in having in everything that I do. Um, right. I mentioned the Widener Philharmonic um, earlier, and and I uh, I not only play with that group, but um, I've been named the artistic director of the group. And oh, congratulations! Thank you. <laughs> uh, which means that I'm <laughs> I'm steering the programming um, at this mm -hmm. point, and I'm I'm committed to making sure that our programs are as broad and inclusive mm -hmm. as they can be um and that you know i'm at the very beginning stages of that work you know i have one upcoming season that that is you know is, is gonna be you know happening next year that that is happening under that sort of guideline and under, mm -hmm. under that direction um you know and so i i, I I'm, I'm on the lookout now for like, what are the ways that I can help expand the notion of what orchestral programming looks like and how mm -hmm. I can make sure that as many different voices and styles as possible are represented on that stage. Um, oh, you mean we don't have to play Beethoven's second piano concerto three times in one season? That's not a requirement. <laughs> no, no, you know, we don't have to do that. <laughs> there are Whoa, options. <laughs> game changer. <laughs> Funnily enough, that. there's more music out there. <laughs> right. Shocking. Yes, yes, I'm stunned. No, and it's, yeah, I do agree that it's getting better, but every now and then there's a big discussion happening online right now because um, Kathy Lakuta, uh, who was actually the episode of this podcast that dropped last week at time yes. of recording, by the time this comes out, it'll have been ages ago. Mm -hmm. She just just told a few days ago that um, a composer she had been speaking to doesn't program women composers. Oh, she, like, great. said it flat out. And it's like, so two steps forward, one step back. We're still oh, going yeah. forward, but every now and then you run into somebody and you're like, can you just go back to the 1930s and stay there? Like, Thank you. Bye. Yeah. Oh, no, that's, I mean, I'm, I am not surprised to hear that. Um, it's, mm -hmm. it's frustrating to hear that. I'm not surprised. I'm not here to pretend that, you know, that there's a new utopia of inclusive programming going on everywhere. Uh, but I am right. committed to trying to do my part. <laughs> And all of that, and that's all we can do, you yeah. know, us as individuals. And and the more that people who are um, maybe not the status quo protectors get into these positions of power, like artistic director, the better chance we have of expanding our our mindsets about what an orchestral season could look like. Yeah. So, you know, I'm wishing you all the best with that. I love that you're doing that oh, job. It's so important. I'm excited. <laughs> I'm really excited. It's it's fun to uh, to just explore and see well, what kinds of musical connections can we make and what kind of stories can we tell on a stage you know and and I'm always surprised I'm like oh there's so much music I haven't heard yet I mean I know I'm I'm not you know ancient and withering away but you know I I just hit 30 this year and I'm like okay I feel like I should know the orchestral repertoire and every day something new I'm like oh yeah I'm never gonna listen to it all and that's yeah. great you know? <laughs> yeah yeah no that that's that's just it is that there is so much right and so mm -hmm. how 
how can you wrap your head around it all? And the the answer is you can't. <laughs> and so, right. <laughs> and, but you can dive in and you can look in as many directions as possible and you can you know go down rabbit holes to see oh what else did this person do and oh who is this person influenced by and oh what you know what are other groups doing and who are the new voices that are coming on the scene and you know how do we find more of those how do we encourage more of those you know well you know I love that because that actually kind of leads to my one of my fun wrap-up questions which is who is your favorite composer and it can be yourself but uh, (laughs) who are you listening to right now (laughs) oh yeah yeah no I mean I you know you you shared the questions with me in advance and I saw that I was like oh no what am I going to say today because the answers change all the time right you know Um, Mm -hmm. uh, and um I um gosh I, I, it's hard to identify one favorite. I can tell you some pieces that were super important to me as I started writing and starting to develop, a, to try to develop a voice. Um, I would say near the top of the list, if not the top, is um, is George Crumb, um, because his way of playing with a sense of time and timelessness, um, his way of playing with resonance, um, his way of building these immersive sort of sound worlds, incredibly influential uh, in the way that I think about writing and um, his his music has, has meant a lot to me. Um, the piece that made me want to be a composer for real um, was Symphony Number no. 1 by John Curliano. Um, that was a symphony written in response to the AIDS epidemic, and it was also written in response to his personal experience with losing friends to AIDS. And the way that he was able to communicate about this broad social issue in a very intimate way and share his personal emotional experiences in the under this larger umbrella of of thinking about the AIDS crisis it was was just the way that the that the music could be both very personal but also have this larger message that was super influential mm-hmm. and just the music just just it it still resonates with me today the that's beautiful itself, it's a it's a great piece um my main composition teachers in graduate school were Shulamit Ron and Marta Tajinska and both of them um have have written amazing music that I I are touch points for me um, so I, I think about their music a lot as well. Um, and then, um, you know, I, I, I also, my first loves of music were pop music and rock music. Um, I, you know, I didn't, I, I grew up in a house where there was music around, but no one was doing anything, you know, remotely like I'm doing now, right? You know, I had a, I had a right. father who played, you know, guitar music um, and, and, and uh, you know, country music on his guitar and, you know, the, a mom who played records and, you know, and, 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 and that was, that was where I first learned how to love music. And so rock music is still really super important to me. And so, you know, Radiohead has to be on the list, you know, of, of faith. I love that, you know, and it's, and, and there's little glimmers of that in, in my music, you know, that, 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 and, and, and I don't know, it's just, I don't, I don't believe in restricting myself to one genre that can be influential. And I, I don't think I'm alone in that. I think a lot of people, um, you know, my age and, and, younger and, and, and older, um, you know, have drawn on those inspirations as well, because it's just part of the fabric of who we are, you know? Um, well, and what a cool career. One day you're playing rock and the other day you're playing rock <laughs> you know, yeah, why why not Why not? It doesn't get better than that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Why so. not? It's, it, it works. It works. And it, and it makes for, you know, 
it makes for a multifaceted kind of experience and I, I wouldn't want it any other way mm -hmm. yeah. so when you're not doing all of these different activities what do you do for fun outside of music things <laughs> yeah yeah um well um I like to knit <laughs> um I like you know so much of the work that we do as musicians um is not visible um and so to work on a knitting project where you can actually see progress is kind of therapeutic right <laughs> you know it's like I that's exactly why i love baking yep that i'm the same way i'm yeah, like yeah. my bread rises it's there and yep. it's done <laughs> it's a tangible thing in the world right yeah it's mm -hmm. and and so yeah until i, I eat it anyways yeah yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's but but it existed right and it and it, it was right <laughs> it, you know you, you could see it you could take a picture of it like you know it's it, it's not mm -hmm. it, it you can't capture you know the way you know what we do in a practice room or you know the scribbles that I put on a piece of paper that you know this is this is two hours of work no one but me knows it's two hours of work because it's you know it's a, it's a few scribbles you know but it 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 it, that one, one piece of paper doesn't feel like much of a physical manifestation of <laughs> what that was but you know right I can watch this thing grow over time and that that feels really good um so I'm um I like to do that um I'm a you know I I, I, I I'm a big fan of skill-based reality tv um, so uh, like, okay, you know, so like I spent a lot of time watching things like Top Chef, <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, and, and the, the, so like that's, I, I follow those things almost like, uh, like that's a job. <laughs> you know, I gotta, I gotta <laughs> figure out, I gotta, I gotta figure out who's going to win. And, and, and there you can pull <laughs> creative strategies from watching what people do on those shows anyway. Like that's, so it's almost like research for work. At least that's what I tell myself right. watching TV. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. That's great. Um, I also <laughs> like to bake a bit. I'm not very good, but I like it. Um, so th yeah, th those are those are a few things. But uh, it's hard not to try to do the creative work all the time, though, because it's mm -hmm. it, there, it's it's never done. <laughs> <laughs> right. And that as someone who loves a to-do list, having one that never ends can be frustrating. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> yeah, that can be tough. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, well, we're coming to the end. This has been so much fun, but before we go, I want to ask, do you have any upcoming pieces or projects you want to promote and talk about? Sure. Um, I don't have anything on the calendar performance wise for a little bit. Summer is going to be a nice kind of uh, relaxing time. Um, that is when I'm going to write this new piece for uh, my trumpet playing friend, Adam Gaines, and he'll be recording that in the fall. We'll be putting out an album at some point down the road. I don't know exactly the timeline, uh, but that's going to be a really um, interesting compilation of um pieces for trumpet and electronics he's going to do an older piece of mine on that album plus this new one um he commissioned um he's he's part of a consortium commission that that is commissioning evan williams who's a really wonderful composer you should check out if you don't know him um so Very cool yeah so so it's all going to be you know newer works for uh for trumpet and electronics so that album will come out eventually i'm not sure when um tbd I, yeah, yeah um if anyone <laughs> this is a long shot but if anyone is in the green bay wisconsin area um on leap day 2024 <laughs> um, okay that will be uh, the second ever performance of a film score that i wrote for the um the film man with a movie camera which is a Russian film from the 1920s, black and white silent film. Um, Ziga Vertov is the director. Um, and it's the film is a day in the life of a Russian city. And it's just showing people, it's, it's, there's no clear storyline. It's just showing, you know, from sunrise to sunset, here are people living their lives. Uh, and I scored this film and it was performed once um, several years ago 
And then the next performance was scheduled for May 2020. So guess uh, guess what happened to that performance? And we finally rescheduled yep. it. <laughs> um, so so um, so I'm excited for for that to finally live again. Um, so so I, that's a piece I wrote for or a score I wrote for um, percussion, horn. So I get to play on it. Um, voice and cello and trumpet. Um, which is a, an odd combination, but again, one of those situations where I was like, well, I'm going to write for my friends. <laughs> so mm-hmm. yep. they play. <laughs> uh, and so we're going to, we're going to perform that in February of uh, Leap Day, February 2024. Um, and again, if, uh, another long shot, anyone in the Green Bay, Wisconsin area, um, the Widener Philharmonics season will be announced shortly. Uh, we have, uh, we have performances that that I helped program in September and again in April. Um, the, and I'm really proud of the work we're doing there. So excited for that to happen. Oh, we'll definitely have to keep a lookout for that uh, announcement. I'm sure by the time this comes out, it'll be out. So maybe I, I hope can, so. Can <laughs> and be like, here you go. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, where can people go to find your music if they want to get sheet music or uh, listen? Sure. Um, my um. I have a, a website that's my full name, Um, It is perpetually under construction and there's not as much on there as there should be. However, my contact information is there and um, I have a number of recordings available um, that are either linked on the website or are easily found on YouTube. Um, and so um, summer project is to make that all easier to deal with. Uh, but but anyone who's interested in reaching out and talking about horn music or, or anything, uh, please feel free to uh, drop me an email. Okay, great. Yeah. Uh, Michelle, this has been so wonderful. I'm glad we finally got to connect. Um, we've been Facebook friends for a little while, I yeah, think. So yeah. it's nice to actually talk to you, which is super cool. Super cool. So um, yeah. Everybody, thank you for joining us today. Uh, We'll be back with you again in a couple of weeks for our next episode. And uh, have a great couple of weeks. Bye. This has been Represent the Podcast. For more episodes, you can find us at Spotify and Apple Podcasts or on my website, www.katiebethmckinney.com. If you liked what you heard today, please rate us five stars or leave a review. Thank you for listening.